Buddhism or the large noblesse oblige is an insulting attitude to take because, you know, the real nature of the human condition is that we're all in it together. This is one of the reasons why I am so hostile to all forms of spiritual hierarchy. I have never seen uh, a, a truly superior person, I don't believe. And if I have, they were so humble and self-effacing that they never would have claimed that superiority as their own. If somebody tells you they're a superior person, my God, they're automatically to be taken off the active list. That alone screws the pooch right there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it's tremendously disempowering. The mushroom said to me once, and I've said it to many of you many times, it said, if, for one human being to seek enlightenment from another is like a grain of sand on the beach seeking enlightenment from another. Don't you get it? It's the same flesh. It's the same flesh. Nobody knows anything you don't know, and even if they do, it's not your knowledge. So what good is it doing you? The idea that it's okay for you not to understand mathematics or not to play the violin because somebody else does it very well is a complete cop-out. You, you will be held responsible, responsible for what you know and what you can do. And using the excuse that you lived in the same world with Yasha Heifetz is not going to get you off the hook of not knowing how to play the violin. I say this as someone who does not play the violin. It, it's, it's fun to take responsibility. It's fun to test the waters. Uh, the hardest thing to put across to oneself and to other people is that the universe is a more friendly place than we have been told. Paranoia, culture is institutionalized paranoia. And it's very hard to decondition oneself from this. No matter how deconditioned you may think you are, there is more and more work to be done. And I think the essence of Taoism and why its roots in nature are so powerful is because what Taoism is saying is if you will quiet your mind and if you will pay attention, you will discover that you are supported and cared for by the dynamic of the universe. This should be obvious by virtue of the fact that you're even alive. I mean, how unlikely is your existence? I put it to you, pretty unlikely. And yet, here you are. Well, do you just think it was the greatest series of, of, of well-rolled dice in history? That's silly. That's ridiculous. Probability would never have delivered us to this room this afternoon. Probability sculpted by loving intent has delivered us to this room this afternoon. Once you can sense that living intent and, you know, make it an object of familiarity, you probably, that is the antidote. To cultural paranoia and to the acceptance of your identity through imposed definitions by other people. Uh, and of course, psychedelics figure in here because they dissolve more dramatically and more effectively than anything else the cultural and linguistic and habitual assumptions that are masking that presence of Tao. You know, it really is true, as uh, the Bible says, you must become as a little child. It, the, that means you must become pre-culture. You must recover who you were before the engines of culture went to work on you and abused you and made you afraid and dumbed you down and distorted your values and so forth and so on. Yeah.
Yeah, see, I think what's happened is that the top of the culture, it's profoundly intellectually bankrupt. There is no plan except to keep peddling stuff, basically until the forests are gone and the oceans polluted. And, uh, it, and this is not malevolent. Well, it's not malevolent. It's simply they are clueless. They have run out of steam. And so the answer is to try and keep the game going as long as possible with daytime TV, with casino gambling, with lotteries, with endless distractions, with pop culture fads, with cults of celebrity, with spectacular trials and gory mass murders and endless circuses while the people at the top are saying, you know, sooner or later, it, the shit is going to hit the fan. Sooner or later, the dam will burst. And they say, well, let's make sure it's later, not sooner, because I've got two kids at the Sorbonne. I'm paying off a Mercedes, and I need to get this taken care of before it all falls apart. So in the absence of any cultural plan imposed from the top, this strange dynamic is happening. This is probably, this has happened before in cultural history, where some huge enterprise like Christianity or patriarchy or something like that, after playing, running its games for millennia, it just runs out of steam. And often there's nothing to rush in and fill the vacuum, nothing that is consciously engineered to do that. And so then in those situations, an actual creative bifurcation can take place because what is about to happen is not in the hands of human managers. It lies deeper in the dynamics of the whole system. And we all feel, I think, this sense of excitement and the approach of the unimaginably new, and we don't know whether it's the aliens coming to pull our chestnuts out of the fire, or virtual reality, or a new drug, or a new style of sexual behaving, or star flight. We don't know what it is, but we can feel that it will transcend the categories of our managers, and they and we will then have to make sense of whatever this new reality is. And, uh, you know, it terrifies some people, it liberates others. It's the same reality. You know, Stephen Vincent Benet says something about, at the end of John's Brown, John Brown's body, he says, uh, when the prophets of strange religions bawl out their bizarre despair, do not join them on the mountain. Say only then, it is here. It is here. Because it is here. I mean, that was 1927 when he wrote that. And he spoke then of, of technology as our humble servant, already half a god. And that was in 1927. You can imagine then what that technology is. Today, yeah, my a manager class. I rather talk about a point in history where there's no more commodities. Yes, I don't think there will be a manager class. A manager class, you manage toward ideology. If we could transcend ideology, the way to manage society, I think, would be self-evident. The problem is trying to force it into the service of some kind of ideological vision. And then, of course, it becomes intractable because no ideological vision we've ever had has been true to our humanness. You know, the Christian version of what human beings are, the Nazi version, the Marxist version, the secular market-oriented version, these all somehow insult various parts of our humanness and so when we're tried, when an attempt is made to push us into these things, it doesn't work. 
and you get instead war, anxiety, and Q forces uh, swamp the social system. Uh, I think the managing of society would be fairly simple in the absence of ideology. But we're addicted to ideology because somewhere along the line we've gotten the idea that you can't understand the world without an ideology. When in fact, and ideologies are incredible impediments 